Tonight, what could have been a vicious rape if it hadn't been for a good Samaritan? Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Let her go! She's my girlfriend. And two ladies locked in after an armed robbery in a jeweler's. We begin with the most controversial case in Britain, and after seven years, far from scaling it down, they are piling on the pressure. The murder of Stephen Lawrence. Stephen Lawrence, the teenager who died after being stabbed at a bus Wilson stop in said Southeast. the men he would refer to as the five main suspects, Neil and Jamie Acourt, Luke Knight, Gary Dobson and David Norris. The friend, Dwayne Brooks, told the jury it was a racist attack. His identification evidence led to the charging of two of the three defendants. They claim that Stephen was murdered by four youths in a racist attack. The magistrate will listen to the evidence over the next few days and decide whether to allow the case to go to trial at the Crown Court. Having fought so hard to get this case to the Old Bailey, the Lawrence family left the court in bitter disappointment. We, that is the family and the lawyers, had hoped that the identification evidence uh, could have been put before a jury something which happens in nearly every other case. At least the family's lawyers have had the chance to question the suspects, though not allowed to ask the key question, did they kill Stephen? It appeared that in a number of material respects, the police conduct of investigations went badly wrong. With Mr and Mrs Lawrence listening, he went on to criticise the delay in the arrest of the principal suspects who were identified soon For after all the, the murder. fury of those who believe these men are murderers, they aren't being brought to trial. At once. One suspect, David Norris, hit out as the youth strutted down the walkway. The report provides a blueprint for improved race relations into the next millennium. His biggest challenge will be to change the culture of this vast organisation. Well, this is a very positive inquiry. Maybe next month, maybe the month after, I'll be back. And here's back, John Grief. Intriguing listening back to those reports over the years. They said there were five people involved in the killing, four, three. I was talking to a guy from the area this morning. He said word on the street is at least six people were involved. How many do you think there were? We've always said there were six people there the night that Stephen was murdered, and they were part of a loose-knit gang uh, with a number of other members in it. Three have already been brought to some sort of trial. That that, but three. that leaves three people who can be charged with murder. Now, the evidence just seems to be falling into your lap at the moment. Just tell us what's happening and why things are moving so fast after seven years. Well, we've got new witnesses. We've got new ways of analysing the massive amount of witness statements that we've already collected. And there are new developments in scientific evidence which are a little short of miraculous in finding conclusive evidence. Now, there's uh, a coat that you took from uh, not that far away from, from the scene. I know you're submitting that to new analysis. And tell us about uh, this knife. Well, we're, we're submitting um, these exhibits because the new techniques can produce things from here that you wouldn't have thought was possible maybe even two months ago. Because however good all of this, you still need witnesses. Seven years have not lessened the Lawrence's determination to bring their son's killers to justice. Dorian, what you've achieved in the past seven years is, is nothing short of remarkable. You've taken on the police, you've taken on the legal establishment, the whole setup. And some people would have given up by now. Well, it's, it's difficult to give up when you know the killers are still out there. I'm going to say they killed my son, so there's no way I'm going to give up. Now, who is it very specifically that you're appealing to tonight? I'm appealing to um, the mothers the girlfriends of the boys who were at the time who would have, have, have heard something the boys would have probably confessed to them there's one particular girl who um, I understand that had heard the confession of one of them about the death of Stephen and I'd like to appeal to her and other mothers and young women wives girlfriends anybody who know anything is to come forward and phone in tonight you know just let us know whatever they, that they know about um, what happened on the night of Stephen's murder. Now, anything they've got to tell us is useful, is vital information. And this is not going to go away, is it, this pressure? It's not going to go away because the killers are still out there. And, and until they've been brought to justice, it's never going to go away. Because I can't rest until his killer's been brought to justice. Now, Neville, the attack on Stephen, this was not an isolated event by this 
uh, group of young men. They were involved, as far as we know, in a whole chain of attacks. It's, it's very important that people come forward with any information about that. Yeah, we know that these people were involved in other crimes, you know, from the school days, and they've committed a lot of crimes in, in the past, and the, the, the one with Stephen was just one of the crimes that they were involved in. And we were appealing to anybody who knows anything about the crimes that they've done in the past, and even now to the present, to come forward and give us some evidence so we can solve this crime. It's essential for you, isn't it, it's to get very, this result? It's, it's very essential. The pain of getting up in the morning and knowing that these people have actually killed somebody and are still out there walking free is really one of the things that I'm finding very hard to live with. Mothers and fathers and relatives who lose a loved one understand exactly what I'm saying. And if anybody who knows anything about this crime, I think it's been long enough for them to understand how painful it is for us to continue to live on this, what, what I call it stress, and need people who know about this crime to come forward and give us some information so that we can put this thing to bed. Neville and Doreen, thanks very much. John, okay. just listening to the Lawrences, listening to you, there, I mean, there are obviously a lot of fundamentally decent people out there who've heard things about this or who weren't directly involved in the killing, who are witnesses, girlfriends, mothers and so forth. And they haven't talked to you for seven years. What's going to prompt them to ring now? Well, some, of them, some of them have talked in the past but have not become witnesses, have not given us witness statements. Um, some people change over time. We know that some of the women were recipients of confessions and they've moved on. As Mrs Lawrence has said, they've become mothers themselves. Uh, this is a matter that needs to be solved and it can be solved by the sort of people that Mr and Mrs Lawrence were talking to. The inquiry team has actually produced a, a computer-generated picture of what led up to, to Stephen's death. It's a map with movements in real time. Uh, it doesn't look fantastic, I have to say, on television, but it is a fantastic way of analysing all the evidence. Just tell us what's happening here. This is Dwayne and this is Stephen. Uh, and there's this sort of yellow blob in front of the, the there is in green. What tell us about the yellow blob in front? Well, Who's a, that? That's a very important witness. In fact, these pictures are distilled from over 70 witness statements and show the complexity of the movement. But that witness there, you can see, this, she, this can, she can see the gang as they cross the road. And we know who that is, and we know what she knows and what evidence she could give. Now, we don't want to go showing further this for various reasons, but later on, if we follow that sequence after the stabbing, there is another yellow blob, and this is a blob... There is another witness, yes. Yeah. Another witness that you can track through. Now, tell us about that witness, and this is, this is a description you put out, this in the blonde. Well, a lot of other witnesses refer to a blonde-haired person, a person... Um, present at the scene. Always been of assumed attack. to be male, incidentally. It looks someone female to me. Which is it, male or female? Though? I'm not going to answer that question, Nick, but I think we are very close tonight to putting a face underneath those curtains of hair. So, look, a lot of evidence is coming together, but there are still people who know a lot, and each month more of them are talking to the police, but please. Speed this up. Let's get this over with tonight, once and for all, for Stephen's family. Call us here in the studio. Call detectives at a dedicated centre. The centre is on a free phone number, 0800 169 6819. The studio is a free call, 0500 600 600. Your calls make all the difference. Joseph Porter has been sentenced to life imprisonment after he attacked a woman in Brighton so severely she lost her unborn child and could have died herself. After an off-duty policeman saw Crime Watch, he spotted Porter living rough. And after being shown on last month's Crime Watch, Liam Slack went voluntarily to a police station in connection with football violence. He's now charged with violent disorder. And Robert Power was charged with four counts of deception and conspiracy following an appeal about a man posing in banks as a construction worker, apparently collecting wages for his men. Most people grow out of crime, but you do get the old lags, and we've called these the Grandad Gang. Since 1998, they've been trying on a scam at petrol stations in London. Have a look at these pictures. One of them will get the cashier's attention, usually about a minor bump to his car, which he says has happened outside. 
and one nipped around the back to steal cash from the office. Do you know any of these three? The incident room number is 0181 284 9427. There's someone else I wouldn't mind getting my hands on, and if you can help, there's a reward of up to £10,000. This man's been going into betting shops and building societies around Birmingham, pulling out a gun and demanding money. He's distinctive at only five foot four. Please give us his name, and his address would be even better. Ring 0121 322 6077. On New Year's Eve, there was a millennium party at a pub in Newcastle on Tyne. Two men left at the same time, and seconds later, one of them was found bleeding to death on the pavement. He'd been stabbed. Lewis John Ekong was seen running away, and we'd like to know why. He's 21, mixed race with a Geordie accent. He may have gone abroad, he may be anywhere. Please let us know. 0191 221 8373. Our next appeal raises all sorts of fears in women's minds, fears which for the vast majority are completely unwarranted. Do remember, being attacked by a stranger is very rare, but we do need your help with this case to find just one man. The Liverpool to Leeds Canal, just south of Leeds at Kirkstall. It's the day before St Valentine's Day. Were you out jogging on that Sunday afternoon? Did you do a spot of fishing? Take a spin on the bike? Take a break beside the water? Or were you just out with friends? And Leeds, as you can see in their change colours, of burgundy and black, get us underway. And Featherstone in the hoops. Familiar colours in... Well, one of these days, you'll get stuck in that chair. I'll see you later. See you later. The second of these four-pound Silk Cup Challenge Cup ties being played in front of a partisan... I thought it's a nice day. You should go out for a walk. It was really sunny, it was really nice. It was the first hot day that we'd had since before Christmas. I decided to go down to the canal because it's a really nice route and we've got loads of locks and things. Every minute there was at least somebody walking past or someone jogging past. This is Redcote Lane Bridge, and it's now about half past three. Further along the canal, enjoying the fresh air, was engineering manager Stuart Jackson. It was a nice day. It was blue sky, uh, quite warm in the sun. Just decided to go for a walk, but quite late in the morning. And when I left home, it would either have been Skipton or, or Leeds I headed for. And it turned out to be Leeds. The first time I stopped out here, I met a fella older than me All with right. a bicycle. I've broken the bloody lamp, trying to get it across that fence back there. And that turned into quite a lengthy conversation. Up until I got towards the power station at Kirkstall, it was, it was quite busy. You can hear the electricity in the power station, it makes a loud hum. And then, all of a sudden, there didn't seem to be anybody about at all. A man passed me on a mountain bike and just in front of me turned around to look back at me. You got time? No. Do you smoke? No, sorry. He was around 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10, medium build, probably mid-twenties and with a strong Leeds accent. I saw him passing me again, going up towards Kirkstall, and um, I saw him stopping in the bushes a couple of hundred feet in front and getting off his bike and going down into the bushes. I started to get quite panicky. Um, I went onto the road and I came off the towpath because I got worried about being next to the canal, hoping that I might see somebody walking along. The man passed me on a mountain bike, it was going too quickly for me to stop him. Wait! And so. I went started back towards Leeds. Well, I'll be off. I'll see you later. If I was walking anywhere on my own, I'd always put my rape alarm in my pocket. Who are you? You have got time. No, no, I haven't. Have you got any money? No. What's this? It's my rape alarm. I was really, really, really scared. Um, I kept begging him to stop doing it, 
I begged him to let me go. Um, I screamed and I was shouting and he just kept telling me to shut up. He was he was really cold. He didn't he didn't show any emotion about it at all and he didn't seem bothered that people could come by. He took a knife out of his pocket and said that if I screamed he was gonna slit my throat. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Let him go off! She's my girlfriend. We're just having an argument. It's all right. Hey, get off her! She's my girlfriend. Alone, We're just having on. an argument. It's it's don't like an right. argument to me. You keep away from her. She's my girlfriend. Come on, look. We're just having an argument. Are you all right? She's got a knife. He was very calm and insisted on this being an argument to the time of him leaving. As if he couldn't understand why I'd intervened on an argument between himself and his girlfriend, but it didn't seem like his girlfriend. There was too much distress there, too many tears. You just want to stop the distress, offer some help. Uh, I can't understand people walking away. I really can't. <laughs> On the way back to call for help, they passed three young men who could have seen the attack. If Stuart hadn't come along, then he would have raped me. He was about to rape me. Trevor, this was a horrific attack, and particularly violent. Very much so. Thankfully, the attack was interrupted, as we saw in the film. But the level of violence used is what really concerns me, together with the fact that a knife was used to threaten the girl as well. Perhaps even more worrying is the fact that this was done in broad daylight in a busy stretch of canal. First nice day of the summer, uh, sorry, the spring, uh, and this man's doing this with really no concern to... He didn't care who saw him, did he? He wore no disguise. No, no, none whatsoever. He just did it. Now, there was something particularly unusual about this attack, wasn't there? Yes, indeed. What the man did was he deliberately and repeatedly licked the girl all over her face. Now, that was a horrible thing to do. But apart from that, I think it may be a sexual habit or fetish that he's got. Perhaps a former girlfriend or a current girlfriend may know somebody who does that. Now, we've got some CCTV of someone who was cycling along. Now, we're not identifying that person because this case no. rests on identification. But what more can you tell us? Well, this particular man was seen uh, near the Royal Armouries and was caught on CCTV. It fits the description of the man we're looking for. But we're not certain that it is him, as you've said, we've blocked that out. Uh, but we do need to talk to him. If he does recognise himself on that, I'd like him to come forward so we can eliminate him. Now, what about the bike? What more can you tell us about that? Well, the bike itself is a mountain bike. Um, it's very scruffy. It's uh, either white or light coloured. And the stickers um, that identify it, etc., seem to have been taken off. Um, and it's described as having like, marks like glue on the frame where the stickers were. Now, somebody might know somebody who's got a bike like that or may have seen one lying around. Now, it was a sunny Sunday afternoon. We saw in that film there, there were a lot of people about. What you're trying to get is witnesses who were out there, not just the people that we saw in the film, but anyone who was out there that afternoon. Yes, indeed. I am particularly interested in tracing the three young men we saw on the bridge. Uh, they may have seen the attack itself. They may have seen the attacker. I've seen both. I'd like to talk to them. But there was a lot of people about, as we saw, more than we've seen on the film. It's a very, very popular area, and it was a nice day. Also, quite close is the Warner Village, which is very, very well used. People might have seen something there. He may have driven through or ridden through there. OK, let's see what we can get. If it hadn't been for Stuart passing by, this could have been a lot, lot worse. Call 0500 040 999. And if you've been a victim of any attack and would like to talk to someone at Victim Support Line, there'll be people there till 2 in the morning, 0845 30 30 900. Now, one of the most ambitious, in fact, ridiculously complicated robberies in Britain. And it all went wrong. There's a big reward if you can recognise any of the many clues the gang left behind. A month ago, a fast inflatable boat was launched on the Thames at Mort Lake and went downstream to Moor near Battersea Power Station. Do you recognise it or know where it's been between Christmas and mid-February, or indeed the trailer that it was on? Nearby, this lorry was parked in Kringle Street, equipped with a battering ram for use in an ambush on an armoured security van. Now, was this the ram? what was this ram originally? There's graffiti on the lorry's girder saying Tottenham scum. Gang members blocked access on Nine Elms Road with these three heavy goods vehicles, bringing much of the South East London to a standstill. 
The plan was to cause traffic chaos, ram the security van and escape on the river. But the gang were left with red faces as their raid completely failed. I wish I was allowed to tell you why. They ran off empty-handed, leaving behind 12 large Metropolis holdalls. Ring 0181 247 7931. The same weekend in February, those robbers brought South London to a standstill. There was a break-in at a house in Sheffield. The distraught owner found he'd lost his mobile phone, his checkbook and his credit cards. And maybe this man can tell us where they are. He tried to use one of the stolen credit cards at an off-license in Silver Hill. And who's this with him? The pair smelt heavily of cigarettes and that's exactly what they were trying to buy. Ring 0114 296 3665. Now a real mystery, but one that's rather macabre. A few weeks ago, two lads came across a bundle dumped by a road in Darnall in Sheffield. Curious, they undid it and they found a human body. The bundle had been on the verge for a month or two, we think, but tests showed the victim had been dead for several years. Where was he kept all that time? Why was he kept? Why did he die? And above all, who is he? Well, take a look at him, or at least take a look at this reconstructed head. Have you any idea who he is? Bob Berry, you've been trying to trace this man for some time now. Um, what do you know about him? And first of all, when would he have disappeared? How long he ago would have he disappeared uh, between 1994 and 1998. And how old was he when he disappeared? He was in he his fifties. He was about five foot four to five foot eight tall, which so, would... so fairly short to medium. That's right. He was uh, slim build, and he had dark brown hair bordering on black, which was actually had some grey in it. We can say that uh, we haven't ruled out the possibility that he's a white man, but it's more likely he comes from uh, an Asian background, or alternatively. North Africa, and we can't rule out the Middle East. Now, you've got a clinical artist we've seen to do different pictures of it. Surprising how much he seems to change, actually, just by changing the, the skin tone. Uh, anything else that you, you, you know about him, from his teeth, his bones, his, or any other, other of the remains? He suffered, he suffered very severely with the arthritis of the spine in his lower back, his upper back, enough, and his neck. A, enough for friends or relatives, anyone to know? Notice? Yes, yes, he would have had difficulty turning and perhaps walking, and he certainly would have complained of considerable pain in his neck and back. The, the surfaces of his teeth are extremely flat, and that could be indicative of the fact that he was chewing tobacco or something of that nature. Part of the wrapping of the body was a sofa cover, which at one stage would have adorned somebody's living room. Uh, now, you don't want anybody who just identifies where that fabric comes from, and I think you know that, but you want somebody who can, who can what? Who can link all the things together. The description that I've given, the facial reconstruction, the medical conditions, and the sofa cover. OK, well, let's see if we can name this man tonight, please. It's a free phone number 0800 783 1258. Now, the seaside town of Bognor Regis in Sussex in February, and it's coming up to closing time for a small jeweller's shop. I've got a watch here that I uh, recently stopped working. I think my boyfriend's overwhelmed it. I was wondering if you could have a look at oh, it, please. Let's have a look. Yes. You know, we, we don't repair them on the premises here, okay. but I can send it away and we'll see what they can find. Oh. Nicholas and Co. Jewellers is on Queensway, just around the corner from the Safeways car park. Who are these two men sitting in a light green metallic Toyota Corolla? When they emerged, one was holding a white plastic bag. The other seemed to be talking continuously into a mobile phone. I could see he had a pinstripe suit on and carrying a briefcase. I wondered if he was perhaps a representative for a watch company or something. He was about six foot tall, fairly slender, dark hair, but a pale complexion, mid to late thirties. We're in. No problem. He was holding his arm rather no awkwardly against his no side. But I thought no maybe problem. he had a, some deformity. Can I help you? Sorry. Don't press anything. Ladies, get together. How do I unlock that door? There's more of us to come. You press that button. 
Over there. When he asked us to do anything, he was always exceedingly polite. Get down on the floor, please. Not the sort of thing you expect from someone who's holding a gun to you. How do you shut the front shutters? In the front window. You just press the button down. When the front shutters were put down, it meant that we were locked in there with them. The second robber was definitely more agitated than the first. Take it off. You don't need that. He had fair to ginger hair, probably late twenties. He was not quite as tall as the first one, and he swore a lot. He was more the type of robber that you would expect. Where's the cash? Where's the cash? We didn't Don't take... Don't turn around. Don't look at me. Where's the cash? We didn't take much... Don't to... turn oh. around. It's in the safe, out the back. Slowly, ladies. Get to your feet. Have you got any mobile phones? No, I haven't. It's a very frightening walk. We're going to lock you in the toilet. Every second I expected to be hit across the head with the gun. I'll try and get you out of here as soon as possible. Customers can use this car park free, provided they produce their Safeway shopping receipt. These men did produce a receipt. No, I can't accept that. I've seen you twice today without any shopping from Safeway. How much do you want? Five pounds. Want a receipt? No. I've never done anything like that in my life before. <laughs> Breaking holes in doors isn't my thing. Five and a half hours later, a light green metallic Toyota Corolla was found on fire in Shripney Lane, four miles away from the car park. It had a dent in the driver's door. Did you see who left it there? And where had it been since it left the Safeways car park? One of the robbers may have been polite, but those two women really did fear for their lives. Pick up the phone, 01243 843 418. And on any case, case call Crime Stoppers, anonymously if you want, on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Take a trip to Sainsbury's now in Leicester and have a look at this man. It's a Friday evening about three months ago. Any idea who he is? He looks remarkably like this picture put together by a woman who was sexually assaulted in the street nearby. She was wheeling her two-year-old son in a pushchair and was only saved by a passerby. Her attacker walked off towards St Matthew's estate. Do you recognise the e-fit or can you rule out the man in the supermarket? Please just give us a call 0116 248 5076. This is Gerardi Chowder. He's been charged with abusing a child at a home in London. He's an Algerian asylum seeker who may be looking for work as a baker. He speaks French as well as heavily accented English and may have headed to Birmingham or tried to hide amongst Algerian communities anywhere. If they knew the circumstances, they'd certainly call. 0181 345 3618. Last December, we reconstructed a series of attacks on girls and women in and around Luton in Bedfordshire. There were over 500 calls, but in the end, a result came from mass DNA sampling. David Ellis has pleaded guilty to 13 serious sex offences. Remember the hijack of two lorries carrying expensive cargo? Two viewers both suggested the same name, and as a direct result, a man has been charged with armed robbery. 
and a conviction on the classic motorbike thefts we showed last September. Over 100 Crime Watch viewers had suspicions. John Roberts and Brian Harland have now been sentenced to, between them, three and a half years in prison. To hear Buck dabbled in a lot of things, not all of them entirely honourable. But why should someone want him dead? And why tie him up, beat him badly, strangle him, then drive his body into the countryside and set him on fire? A year ago in March, Tahir left his restaurant in Wembley in the evening and drove off in his Mitsubishi Shogun. It was an imported model known as a Pajero. We know he ate a last meal of sausage and veg, but where? There's someone we need to track down. Who rang to hear his wife late that night from a phone box in the Uxbridge Road in West London? If you know anything, please call and tip us off. There's a £10,000 reward. 0181 358 1755. Quickly tell you about some of the calls we've had on the Lawrence inquiry. We had a smattering of racist calls at the beginning, but they've been swamped now by people from the Eltham area. Incidentally, most of them giving their names and addresses, which the detectives are really pleased about, for one thing. Uh, several new bits of information coming in. One in particular has named the blonde man. I know the police are particularly interested in that. On the Kirksell attempted rape, uh, again, quite a few calls. I haven't got uh, numbers on that, but one call I did see is from somebody who's put a name to it and says he's absolutely convinced that that is the man who attempted the rape. Now, let's see if you can help with this one. Wanted all men now aged in their 40s and 50s who've lived in the Brighton area of Sussex. In 1967, a grammar school boy was murdered, probably by other boys who robbed him of four shillings. That's 20 pence. remember very much before and I don't remember very much after but I do remember that incident unexpectedly my father came home and he was very upset very very upset I remember him opening the door to our lounge and just basically falling into my mother's arms Ken told me that Keith had been found um, on the past and I said, yes, well, he was going to Wooding Dean. And that was the beginning of the rest of our life. My father was a successful band leader. He had several orchestras that would go out under his name, Ken Lyon Orchestra. This was the time my parents seemed to have everything they wanted, really. and had a nice house, uh, had two children. They were very happy at the time. I saw a couple of nice suits that were good for my holiday. Most Saturdays, Dad had to leave after lunch to go to work, and the equally musical children had piano practice. But Keith asked if he could first walk to nearby shops to buy some things for school. So, around quarter to four, wearing his grammar school tie and with four shillings in his pocket, Keith set off up Ovingdean Road and out onto the bridle path across the Downs. My husband was at work, and uh, I think it was the Metropole Hotel. Well, that was marvellous. Thank you from the orchestra. The and detectives um, had yeah. gone and told Ken, and he just so got off the stage and came the with time. them. He was just shattered, and uh, then, of course, the police told us what they knew, and uh, they eventually went, and we just sat and with our arms round each other and, and wept. It was a frenzied and vicious attack. Those are the words of a senior detective. Keith had been stabbed 13 times, and it all made front-page news. a painstaking inch-by-inch inch search of these vast, fallow farm fields behind me, looking for clues... But some key people were never found. There was a motorcyclist, 
but above all, a group of boys seen fighting. Were they just larking around, or were they robbing Keith? The knife itself was found nearby, in the grounds of Fitzherbert School. It had been given away with packets of washing powder. Fifty yards away is a cemetery with public lavatories, and more clues were found there. Good morning. Good morning sir. Here yet? Yes, Mr. Marshall's already inside. Thank you. Someone had been washing in a hurry. There was Keith's blood, but also someone else's, and fingerprints. There was an enormous investigation at the time. They fingerprinted some 6,000 local youths aged between 12 and 18. But it wasn't compulsory. The police couldn't force anybody to have their fingerprints taken. It was a voluntary thing, with the permission of their parents. And so a number of youths or children uh, at the time did not have their fingerprints taken. In the next few weeks, someone wrote to the police claiming to know who was involved. These may well have been a hoax, but almost certainly several people did have some idea, and no doubt they still do. As this murder is still unsolved, somehow my life has been held in a kind of limbo from the day he died until the present day. Whoever did this murdered my brother and took away my childhood. And I can honestly say I haven't had a happy day, a happy, complete day in my life. David, it's such a tragic story, and the tragedy goes on. I'm just trying to think of people in the community, 33 years ago, who heard something or who were on the fringes of this, who know something. How can you prompt them to ring in now after all this time? Well, advances in technology mean that we can take a fresh look at the evidence that was found at the time. It may be that if those youths were involved, there's perhaps one of them didn't pay a major part, and perhaps with his conscience now playing on his mind, he should make contact with us, tell us his side of the story before we go knocking on his door. So a bit like the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, you're now using new forensic science techniques on evidence from the time. That is correct, yes. We're able to do that with the evidence that we found. Now, so many people must have known something about this. I mean, let, let's face it, this wasn't a, a band of, of carefully plotting villains. It looks as though this was a bunch of kids. They, they don't know how to keep a secret. This would have spread like wild for lots of people would have heard about it. Lots of people would have suspicions. That's, that's right. We're sure the answer lies somewhere in the community. We want people to, if they've heard anything, somebody said something to them, we want them to come forward and tell us what they know. We can then decide and assess whether that information will take us further forward with this inquiry. And that's just not one person you need. You need lots of people to ring. You need all the bits of arrows to come and point in the same direction. I, I know you've already had one call I mean, before Crumbridge was on the air. Because of the reconstruction, the Brighton Argus was doing a, a feature, somebody saw that and has already rung you, but not coming up with enough information. That's right. There was a motor motorcyclist shown in the clip. Uh, we weren't able to trace that person at the time. If they're watching, please contact us. The person that has contacted us say that they know who that motorcyclist was. If that person's watching tonight, can you please contact us again? We are determined to do everything we can for Keith's family to find out who is responsible for killing him. Well, let's tr try and solve this tonight, please. Please do call. Anything you know at all, the incident room is a local call number 0845 60 70 999. That's 0845 60 70 9999. Or call us here in the studio. It's a free call 0500 600 600. Now, a dramatic picture with such clarity, I'm sure someone will recognise this hooligan. It was a day out at Wembley last year. A couple took their four-year-old daughter to the Worthington Cup final. They thought they were safe in the family enclosure when suddenly the mum was attacked from behind with a fist in the jaw. Take a good hard look. Ring us please. 0181 903 1212. True life is so often stranger than fiction and this is Michael Vincent Palmer. He was on trial for armed robbery when he leapt over the dock and ran out of court. He's in fact a keep fit fanatic. In the past he's used different identities but whatever he calls himself, let's get him the right side of the dock again. Call. 0121 626 5002. 
Now, a face for you to find. Alan Shreenan was thought to be involved with the murder of a man who was found stabbed on a doorstep in Dumbartonshire last April. Do you know where he is tonight? 01389 822059. Now, a terrible Christmas present for a man in his 60s walking home in Lincoln. Someone grabbed him from behind, demanded money, then hit him repeatedly with a snooker cue. The victim had multiple fractures and was left semi-conscious. This man might not have been involved, but he was seen with a snooker cue in a nearby shop. Let us know. Call 01522 885 397. And, of course, you can call the studio 0500 600 600. Remember this, the elderly man who suffered from Alzheimer's and the police surveillance camera set up in his house, which showed a visitor who kept demanding money he claimed he was owed. You left a salt salmon here for me today. I have money. Of course you have, mate. Don't be silly. I have my money. Sadly, the victim has now died, but viewers have named his visitor as John Mitchell, 26, last known to be in Chichester in Sussex. Where is he now? Several people have asked to see some of the faces we've shown tonight. So here they are again, the Sheffield cigarette men, if you like, who were using stolen credit cards. The sunglasses man, only about five foot four, he's wanted for armed robbery. Gerardi Chowder, an Algerian charged with abusing a child. And uh, who's this? A reconstructed head from remains found near Sheffield. On any of these cases, just call us here 0500 600 600. Now, we've had quite a lot of calls on that reconstructed head, and interestingly, um, one person who's rung in who thinks it might have been her boyfriend. Um, we've had three names for the Grandad gang. You remember those, the burglaries and petrol stations. We're getting a lot of calls on the Kirkstall rape. Two police officers have rung in, saying they know who the man is. Now, on the Bognor Regis jewellery robbery, we've had two people calling in for that, saying they know who the robbers are. And in one instance, someone who's rung in saying they think they committed another robbery. Now, the calls are still coming in. And the lines are open until midnight. You'll find instant room numbers for each of our appeals on CFAX on page 621. Or you can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. And you can see one of Crimewatch's most dramatic breakthroughs, a Cornish DJ living in Spain who was sentenced to life imprisonment for a series of sex attacks in London and the South East. DNA's come back from the lab. It's positive. It's a match. We'll be telling you the whole story on Crime Watch File on Tuesday, April the 4th. Back to tonight. Join us for Crime Watch Update. That's at 11.10. Together, we're making things better, so don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. All sorts of progress on the Stephen Lawrence case, including, though not as a direct result of Crime Watch, a number of arrests. And on the Kirksall attempted rape, that's the attempted rape on the Leeds Liverpool Canal, if you remember, we've had one very promising identification. More on that in a minute. So, after seven years, can one of Britain's most notorious and controversial crimes finally be solved? The murder of Stephen Lawrence. You've had uh, a lot of calls, I know. Uh, but tell us about these arrests. Well, we've uh, arrested uh, people during the course of the day, but actually during the course of the programme tonight, uh, relevant to the things we were talking about, but not directly as a result of these calls that we received. However, of the calls that we received, some of them actually relate to the people that we're very, very interested in and that we've been appealing about. One of the things I know one of your colleagues was excited about is that almost every one of these people have been prepared to give their, their names and addresses. I mean, this isn't sort of... An no, no. anonymous calls and also I mean you know lots of information these are going over two or three pages some of those yes it proves what we said that uh, crime watch works that there are people out there who do have evidence do know where to send us for the evidence and it's quite possible to solve this case John I, I suspect the people that Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence were appealing to directly, and perhaps some of those you were appealing to directly before wives girlfriends mothers and all this sort of thing people on the fringes of the gang aren't the people who've rung tonight they're going to need to mull this over. They're going to take a day or two or three or four to think through. 
yes, that's right. Some of this is extremely relevant. Some of the people we're appealing to directly will need reassurance, will want to think about this. And the local MP, Clive Efford, is prepared to act as an honest broker at his constituency office there tonight or at the House of Commons over the next few days if people are worried about talking to us directly. We know there are people out there with the evidence we need to convict Stephen's murderers. Thank you, John. Firstly, that snooker queue attack on the elderly gentleman in Lincoln last December. Now, a number of people have called in saying they're not sure that they've got the full picture because they haven't got widescreen TVs. I'm afraid that is it. That's the best we can do, but there is quite a clear shot of his face. If you know who he is, please keep ringing in. And secondly, that sunglasses robber up in Birmingham. We've had quite a lot of names suggested for him and sightings. Now, one lady's rung in. I've got a call here. She said she saw him today and she's described his clothing. And in fact, that's the clothing he was wearing on one of the attacks. So that's more than helpful. Thank you for that. Still keep ringing in. And the terrible attack by the Leeds Liverpool Canal that would have ended in rape if it hadn't been for the bravery of a passerby. Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Let her go! She's my girlfriend. We're just having an argument. It's all right. Hey, get off her. She's my girlfriend. We're just Come having on. an argument. It don't like an argument right. to me. You keep away from her. She's my girlfriend. Come on, love. We're just having an argument. Are you all right? So, Trevor, what have we got so far? Very good response, Fiona. We have had one call from a man who has given us some information and is adamant he knows who the offender is. I need to talk to that man again. He knows who he is. I'd encourage him to ring me back. What about the bike? Any more on that? Lots of lines, lines of inquiry on the bike. Um, all of those will be followed up. I don't want to into that too much just yet. And witnesses? Could do with more witnesses, but we had one very good promising call from a person who believes that he was one of those lads I was chasing on the bridge. And that was someone you're trying to get hold of, but Very most important so. of all, whoever it was that rang in and said they know who this person is, we need to hear from you again. You know who you are if you're watching. Please call in. Now, uh, a gruesome discovery and a, a mystery we hope to solve tonight. The discovery was a bundle dumped by a road in Darnall in Sheffield. What was gruesome was inside was the corpse of a man who'd been dead for several years, and we were trying to find out who was he. Bob, how well have you done? We've had an excellent response here in the studio, well over 30 calls. A number of those calls are naming people who they think resemble the, uh, the reconstruction. There are two particular calls from the Sheffield area, which we're very interested in, but we will need to do some more research into it's those. It's intriguing when you put different pigmentations on the face, as, as you've got a clinical artist to do, how, how different he looks. But are you confident you're going to solve this one? I think it's a little early at this moment in time, but we have had a good response, and the calls that we have received will need some further research. Well, Bob, thank you. OK, I hope you, uh, hope you resolve Thanks, it quite quickly. Thanks. Now, remember the two ladies in Bognor Regis who were locked in the loo after their jewellers had been raided? Never done anything like that in my life before. <laughs> Breaking holes in doors isn't my thing. Now these were the two efits of the two robbers. We've had a lot of calls in. We've had um, about 15 names mentioned so far. Now someone's re rung in saying that one of the robbers is a very close relative, so that's very promising. And then a couple of calls saying that they know of similar robberies that they believe have been carried out by the same two people. But what we haven't had, we've got nothing on the car and where the car went after the robbery. If you remember, it was very distinctive, a light green metallic Toyota Corolla with a dent in the driver's door. If you know anything about that, give us a call. Remember Jiraidi Chowder wanted for abusing a young child? Well, we've had two callers, both that know him very well, and they're confident that he's in Hackney. And that rings true with the team, but we need to know exactly where he is. Now, really important case, the hooligan, the football hooligan who um, put a fist into a, a lady's um, face. Now, we must find this person. We've had one caller who's so confident that he, that in naming him that if it's not him, then it must be his twin brother. But keep, on, keep those calls coming in. We've got to crack this case. The oldest case we've ever covered was the desperately sad story of a 12-year-old schoolboy who was stabbed to death one Sunday afternoon in 1967. One of the likely explanations is that he was attacked by other boys of his own age and we're hoping that other people who were children at the time would ring in to tell us what had happened. And David would be quite wrong to raise 
the hopes of the Lions family on this, unless we're pretty sure. But I have to say, I've been quite, pretty excited by the calls you've been having tonight. Yes, we've, I'm really pleased. We've had a number of calls both here in the studio and at uh, Brighton. Uh, a lot of names have been suggested, but not just names, and also other information that we didn't have before, giving us some strong leads that we can now follow up. When I was looking through some of the calls uh, an hour or so ago, they seem to be fairly general. I mean, lots of lots of names, nothing very specific. But I gather the last 15, 20 minutes, you've really had some very interesting ones. We have, yes, indeed. And uh, a couple of those calls have uh, suggested the same name as well. Somebody who hasn't featured in the inquiry before. So, yes, we're pleased. Now, the difficulty is, you're talking about something over 30 years ago. You've now got to trace these people. Yes, we have, but a lot of the, uh, the characters and the people involved in this inquiry still reside in the Wooding Dean area of Brighton, so we're hopeful that uh, we will still be able to find them. I know one uh, was said to have uh, departed fairly soon after the murder in suspicious circumstances. That's at least somebody to find, but anyway, good luck with it, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Calls are still coming in and the lines are open for another half hour or so. You'll find instant rooms for each of our appeals on CFAX on page 61. You can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. If you want to call on any crime we haven't covered, there's Crime Stoppers on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. If you've been a victim and would like to talk to someone at Victim Support Line, there'll be people there till 2 in the morning. The number's 0845 30 30 900. And if you watch next month, you'll see what progress we've made. Incidentally, uh, next month, Crime Watch moves to Wednesdays. That's Wednesday, April the 19th, to put into your diary. Uh, don't forget the phone lines are staying open for another 40 minutes, so please do call any time you want until midnight. Meantime, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Good night.